Okay, good evening everyone. I uh, would like to welcome you to this um, program, um, program organized by Healthy Living in You. And today we are privileged to have in our midst Dr. Abayomi Ajigini. And today our focus will be on aging and back pain. And uh, without wasting time, I would like us to just listen to a little bit. Uh, for those that are joining us online, I'd like to welcome you. As the program is going on, if you have any questions, just post them in the chat box and we will take time at the end of the presentation to give attention to all your questions. And for those that are joining us via Zoom, you can also leave your comments and your questions in the chat box as well and we'll give attention to them as well. Okay, so we'd like to know a little bit about Dr. Abayomi Ajigine. So just one moment, please. A short profile on Dr. Abayomi Ajigine. Dr. Abayomi Ajigine, also known as Dr. Aji obtained his primary medical qualification, MBBS, from the University of Lagos in Nigeria, and subsequently trained as a surgeon in UK, obtaining the fellowship of the Royal College of Surgeons of Edinburgh. After obtaining MBA from the University of Surrey in 2006, with a focus on healthcare management, he decided to train as a general practitioner and obtain the membership of the Royal Colleges of General Practitioners. MRCGP in 2011. He is currently working as a freelance GP in Kent while studying for a Master of Sports Science MSc degree from the University of Bath. He is passionate about promoting good health and well-being, especially among the Black and minority ethnic BAME groups in South East London. He currently heads the medical team of a Christian charitable organization Christ Faith Tabernacle International, and has organized various outreach of programs in conjunction with the Royal Bureau of Greenwich Public Health Team, Prostate Cancer UK, Cancer Research UK, British Heart Foundation, and Sickle Cell Society. Please, with a round of applause, let's make welcome Dr. Abayomi Ajikini. Okay. All right, we'd like to welcome Dr. Abayomi Ajigini once again, and uh, we're glad to have you here with us this evening. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> All right, so over to you now. Um, all right, thank you, um, Jokes. Uh, well, I mean, uh, to everyone, I call her Jokes because we've been Jokes and uh, Yomi, you know, from when we were little. So, um, so um, I might just call our talks, uh, you know. Uh, so, thanks um, for uh, for having me on your program and uh, on this good work that you are doing. You know, uh, making sure that okay, fine. Uh, we are all being well looked after and uh, maintaining a healthy uh, and a good life. Um, I mean, when talks called me. And said, Ah, you're me. <laughs> I've come again, though. And it's like, Okay, yeah, what is it? And she said, Okay, we're talking about 
aging and back pain. I was like, hey, hey, are you telling me I'm getting old or what? Oh, what are you telling me? Uh, but then I looked at it and I said, okay, yeah, we, it's, 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 it's an appropriate uh, thing, uh, topic to actually go into and to discuss um, because um, back pain is one of the, if not the most, com uh, the commonest um, uh, disability, source of disability worldwide. Um, and um, as a doctor, especially a GP, you will see loads of patients with back pain um, every single day. Um, so I said, okay, I'll take it on. Um, and so I'm happy to take it on. And I can see a few people coming in. Um, some of them, my colleagues um, that we train together, some we've not seen for a while, you know, and uh, some I know. So it's going to be uh, an interesting um, day. And I really appreciate those people uh, logging in and uh, uh, coming in and it's going to be a yes I've got some slides which I will share uh, uh, presently uh, but uh, I'm happy to take questions as we go along because um, as we know back pain is quite a big topic to cover um, and um, uh, we cover some areas but uh, also I will leave room for questions because uh, almost every one of us at one stage in life, we will have back pain. And um, uh, the, the different people with different um, experience and what might have caused their back pain. And some people might have, uh, I mean, be having some back pain at the moment. And so they have a question or two that um, hopefully uh, will be able to address as, as we go along. So a bit of science will be there, but a bit of a uh, simple advice and uh, everything. And then we see how much we can uh, cover. So I'll go ahead and share my screen and then we start the presentation. I hope everyone can see my screen. Okay, so let's let's go. Um, let's go back to the start. Yeah, um, as I was presented, my name is uh, Dr. Abayo Magigini, um, and yes, I trained in the. Uh, that great university called University Law, um, Loot or College of Medicine of the University of Lagos. Uh, so many months now I graduated and then I trained um, as a surgeon, uh, obtaining a fellowship of the Royal College of Surgeons of Edinburgh. And um, when I was training as a surgeon, um, there are two areas. I mean, when I was in medical school, I wanted to be a cardiothoracic surgeon, but then life happened. I found myself in UK. I wanted to be in US. I found myself in UK and I started training as a surgeon in UK. Uh, and initially I wanted to be a spinal surgeon. And uh, I was in orthopedics and I wanted to be a spinal surgeon. And everybody was like, hmm, Aji. As a spinal surgeon, you will see loads of patients that will never leave your clinic. Um, there will be patients with back pain and they will never leave your clinic. And, and it, it used to be true because the management of back pain can be frustrating and can be less rewarding. And um, especially to a surgeon, to a surgeon, it's like a man with a hammer. Everything will look like a nail. To a surgeon, you come, he wants to cut. And um, very few causes of back pain are amenable to surgery. Majority of the causes of back pain um, uh, should be managed you know, by different modalities. So during this talk, I will talk about that. So basically, I said, okay, after working in um, uh, neurosurgery, spinal surgery for a while, 
I just said, you know what? I don't think I, uh, I will be there managing back pain as a surgeon. And I changed into, uh, you know, uh, limb surgery. But then I stopped orthopedics and I trained as a, a, a GP. And lo and behold, most of my days as a GP, I end up seeing loads of back pain again. Uh, when sports medicine, back pain again. And that's just to uh, let us know how common and how prevalent back pain is. And then we now add aging and back pain as our topic today. So um, my first slide, it's a famous slide that most, if not all of us, will have heard about a gentleman called William Shakespeare. And they talk about the seven stages of life or the seven ages of life. And in his famous quotation, he said, all the world is a stage and all the men and women, we are merely players. We all have our exits and our entrances. Interesting, he talks about exits before entrances. Um, and one man in his time plays many parts. Uh, his acts being seven ages. And those are the ages that you can see, you know, depicted there. Um, you know, you start, uh, let me just go back. And uh, so you start um, from infancy, a little boy that is crawling down, uh, you know, behind everybody. Then you go to the age of a schoolboy. And then from schoolboy, you go to the age of a teenager or a lover, where you start whispering sweet nothings to someone else. Um, and then from a lover, you go to the age of a soldier, um, where you start looking at being responsible and you start standing up for your rights and the rights of your country and everything. And then from a soldier, you go to middle age, which quite a lot of us on this uh, forum uh, today will be. And, um, you know, and during the middle age, you're just looking for justice for the world, justice for yourself. And what can you make of yourself and of your life? Then from there, you move to the old age group, you know, and then from the old age, you go to the stage of the second childhood again, or uh, what is called, uh, you know, uh, looking forward to death, you know. And that second childhood is called second childhood in the fact that as a child, you know, the infancy stage, the first thing is you get people leading you about, you get people teaching you how to walk, people teaching you how to talk. When you now become so old again, you have people leading you about and also people teaching you how to talk because you lose yourself, you lose the control. You know, majority of people, uh, they now have to be taught how to behave and comport themselves in the public again um, and uh, working with sticks and everything. So that's the, why did I go into that? It's because back pain is prevalent in all the ages apart from infancy, which we might not be able to say. And uh, various things cause back age at those stages. And I'll get back to that in a minute. But WHO talked about aging. And when they were describing aging, they were like, okay, this is a process that it cuts across the life and it's at the biological level itself. That means the composition of the human level. It's because several processes have been happening in the human bodies that you have accumulation of various metabolism, metabolic waste and the various degenerative changes, various repair changes have been happening over several years to the extent that all this accumulation of the what we call cellular damage and everything, we then gradually lead to reduce physical activity, reduce mental capacity, and a growing risk of disease and ultimately death. That's what WHO defined aging in us. And all of us are going through that processes at the moment. However, now we are looking at 
process or what we call successful aging or aging gracefully. And WHO is trying to promote this decade from 2021 to 2030 as a decade of, um, shall I say, trying to get people to age gracefully and to age successfully. Just as they define health as not just mere the absence of disease, but a state of complete physical, mental, and social well-being. The, you know, there is the aspect of successful aging. Also, that it does not only mean you are not suffering from chronic diseases, but you should have optimal social engagement and mental health, as well as lack of physical disability. And back pain happened to be the commonest disability in the whole wide world, as well as the commonest non-communicable disease, you know? So with World Health Organization looking at 2021 to 2030 as, you know, decade of healthy aging. So this talk, uh, you know, kind of coming appropriate at an appropriate time to give us a kind of snapshot and a kind of, um, should I say, gel up so that at least if we've not been doing some things before, let's start doing them now while we look forward to the next 10 years while we age gracefully. So, and their plan is to reduce health inequalities and to, the, to improve the lives of older people, their families and communities through collective actions, which includes health, uh, you know, uh, removing health inequalities and everything. And they found out that, okay, some statistics between 2015 and 2050, the proportion of the world's population over 60 years will nearly double from 12% to 22%, you know? And most of these people, 80% of these people, you know, by 2050 will be living in the, you know, low income or mid income uh, population. Um, and the uh, countries, um, and uh, while the high income countries will not be um, that uh, in number. And interestingly also, it's found out that by that time, back pain and its effect will actually be affecting a lot of people as it is now in the low and middle income uh, countries or because life has changed. A lot of uh, changes have been happening to them and a lot of things are not even available for them to be able to use. So back pain, um, I just put these pictures there. Most of us uh, will have seen uh, someone, you know, uh, maybe a young lass or woman or middle-aged woman clutching their back and that's the typical posture of lower back pain. Um, and when we talk about lower back, we talk about area below the rib cages, you know, which start at L1, what we call lumbar vertebrae one. And it ends just at the lower part of the gluteal or the, the bum, you know. So that's the lower, what we call the lower back. And um, it has a, a set of uh, bones and structures that constitute it, um, and um, the area, the picture on the right, um, uh, you know, uh, it's just a picture of the spinal, um, shall I say, uh, the vertebrae, um, without the cushion, what we call the disc. The disc are the cushion, but the reason why they, uh, there are so many different causes of back pain and um, back pain can be uh, very um, disconcerting. It's because there are loads of structures in the back which can be the source of the back pain. Um, the cushion between the bones, what we call the disc, can be the source of the back pain. The bones themselves, the articulation between the bones, the processes, um, and the muscles, the ligaments, um, the nerve roots, um, they all can be the source of the back pain. And um, uh, when you come to the doctor, it's now left for the doctor to try and tease out what is actually causing your back pain. 
And um, as we age, um, the importance and the of uh, different structures can then uh, be appreciated. Um, as I said while I was starting, uh, my back pain is a big topic. I will cover as much as possible, but I will also try and give a room for questions so that people can ask questions pertaining to their situation and their area. Um, because if we are dealing with aging and back pain, while I might just mention some of the causes of acute back pain, uh, that means back pain that um, is happening now and it just happened for over um, 12 weeks. Uh, most of the causes of um, uh, back pain in the aging population, they are chronic, what we call chronic. That means they have been going on for more than 12 weeks in nature and some started when we were teenagers. Um, in fact, when you get to 50 years of age, if you've not had back pain and uh, your first back pain at 50 years of is at 50 years of age, the doctors get worried, everybody gets worried. It's one of those things we call red flag, you know. Um, so, and that's it. Um, let's go. These are some words that you will have heard and um, that uh, people use to describe uh, various types of back pain. Um, these are not exhaustive, um, you know, but these are common words uh, that you will have heard. Um, they are all descriptive in nature. They don't really, um, uh, uh, should I say, convey a particular diagnosis because what happened is so what someone think is sciatica is actually when you look at it, it's not sciatica. Um, so I'll just quickly touch on them and then I'll go on with the talk. I mean, um, sciatica, it's one of the bane of the lives of most people with back pain. Um, and it just means something is irritating the nerve roots that supply the lower legs, uh, you know, basically. So those nerve roots start from L4, 5, S1, 2, 3. Um, you know, when I say L4, that's the lumbar um, uh, vertebrae um, or lumbar nerve root 4. And then 5 um, and S is uh, what we call sacral bone, or some people call it the tailbone. Um, so you have the nerve roots. Um, if I just um, I go back, I mean, I go back to the previous slides and just show, you know, you see those nerve roots uh, from the pictures on the left, those yellow projections that comes out at the back, um, they are what they are called the nerve roots and the nerve roots come together to form um, uh, the nerves that supply the lower leg and the big uh, nerve that supplies the lower leg is called the sciatic nerve. So sciatica just means something irritating the sciatic nerve. Um, and it might be, uh, you know, uh, the muscles of the back irritating the sciatic nerve. It might be a, a disc that, um, that is torn and prolapsed, irritating the sciatic nerve. It might just be that, okay, the bones are crushing and they are uh, irritating the sciatic nerve. Um, so various things cause uh, what is called sciatica. But the definition of sciatica, uh, when a patient comes and say, oh, I have sciatica, and you ask them, okay, so what's, uh, what's describe the pain you are having? And they say, oh, my pain is in my back. It goes to the other side and it's just uh, be above my knee. You don't really say that's sciatica because sciatica by definition, the pain must, be be, must get to below the knee and down to the foot. So any pain that is not below the foot is not sciatica in truth, you know, but to a patient, um, it's, it's my sciatic nerve, it's my sciatica, you know, and they can either be done uh, irritated by, as I said, uh, by bone muscle, uh, you know, and the commonest muscle that tends to irritate it is a deep muscle that we call piriformis. And so uh, the patient finds it that if they bend to pull their shoes on, they have a nasty shooting pain uh, going down their leg. 
yeah, then we call it piriformis syndrome uh, rather than sciatica, but it is an irritation of the sciatic nerve. And that's why I say sciatica is not really a diagnosis, but it's a description of what is happening. Um, and the way you diagnose piriformis uh, syndrome is just tell the patient to try and cross their leg over the other side. You know, most women can sit down and cross their leg, you know, uh, by bending uh, their knees. Um, you know, but a lot of people cannot do that, especially if you have piriformis uh, syndrome. Um, they experience shooting pain down there. Sleep disc, the um, cushion between the bones is what we call the disc. Um, and as the back age, then there becomes, um, should I say, laxity, and the uh, disc can then slip forward or backwards. Most of the time, it does slip backward. And when that happens, it presses on the nerve roots, and it can either give the pain that goes all the way down to the legs or just uh, a pain on the back. Um, it's one of the common, uh, commonest reasons why a patient ends up having a surgical uh, management of their back pain. We have wear and tear. I mean, it's like, oh my goodness. If you go to a doctor and the, and the doctor said, okay, you have wear and tear. It's like, that is uh, like a dead sentence because uh, for a patient, you tell them they have wear and tear. Um, while it might not mean much to you, you know, but that for a doctor to say I have well and tear, that means uh, something very bad is actually happening. So it's also a part of old age and aging. Um, sometimes it's, it's, it's uh, synonymous with arthritis, you know, and all oh, spondylosis of the spine. And uh, all it just uh, nowadays, we try not to say wear and tear because a lot of research has shown that it's actually the body, you know, repairing itself. So we call it wear and repair. Um, when there is damage or wear out, you know, because of age, because of use, the body makes an attempt at repairing uh, the, the, wear, the wearing changes. But these um, attempts at repair, uh, they are not as finite and very uh, refined as what is there before. So you then end up forming bones that are not laid down in the proper places, what we call osteophytes, extra bones. So sometimes when you then go to the doctors, they do x-rays, they see a thick or extra layer of bone being laid down or either or at the edges of the vertebrae, you know, where they lay on top of one another, or um, along the edges, either, and these bones might end up be, being formed like spicules, what is called osteophytes. And these spicules might either be in front or back, might be encroaching either in the canal, uh, spinal canal, or encroaching on the nerve roots um, um, spaces. Um, and they will be causing pain. So the process of the body trying to repair itself is also uh, one of the reasons why a lot of people get um, um, uh, back pain. Um, lumbago, the commonest lumbago, and that in truth just means uh, pain in the lower back, you know, because we talk about lumbar spine um, and go, you know, just means pain in the lower back, whatever might be the cause of it. Complete spine. I put it in red because it's like, oh my goodness. If a doctor should say, yes, you have complete spine. And it's quite a common thing um, now as people are aging. It's also called osteoporosis, um, you know, because of the. Because... Hello? Okay. Sorry. We can hear you. Okay. All right. Thank you. So it's a complex spine or osteoporosis um, whereby the quality of the bones, you know, become reduced. And that, uh, you know, um, sets in um, gradually. Sometimes it's the effect of menopause. 
sometimes um, it's just because of aging and um, a lot of issues going on. Uh, and of course, um, arthritis, which um, is just like the wear and tear. So the doctor might say, oh, you have arthritis in the back. Um, or somebody might say, oh, you have a, a, a spondylosis, which is basically like an arthritis of the spine, um, which can go either from the top of the neck, you know, to the lower back. Um, and uh, so, um, and then the disc itself, uh, when it gets worn out, it becomes degenerative. And then um, normally the disc is well moist, cushioned, uh, but as it becomes degenerative, the water content becomes reduced. And then so instead of it being lovely cushions, uh, plastic bouncy stuff, it just becomes hard and crumbly. And then gradually the height the, uh, between the uh, bone, the disc space, what we call the disc space, which is the space between the top and the lower bone becomes reduced because the disc is become crumbly. And sometimes it, it, uh, it's, uh, it's uh, crumbled off and uh, dropped off. And um, because the disc um, medically, we say the disc has two components. Um, the outside and the inside. The inside is called nucleus pulposus, while the outside is called annulus fibrosus. Um, the annulus fibrosus, which is a fibrous uh, thickened thing, if it uh, that's the uh, when you have a disc tear, it starts. That's where the tear comes from, and then when the tear happens. You the disc, the nucleus pulposus, which is more fluidy, more soft, can then herniate. So you might hear someone say, oh, herniated disc. It's because the annulus fibrosus has been torn, and then the nucleus pulposus, which is the central uh, part of the disc, uh, being compressed, then herniated. Um, and uh, this herniated disc might not cause any, any problem, while sometimes it actually starts encroaching on the nerve roots exit. Um, and then it will have to, if it happens acutely, especially in younger people carrying weight or flexing, turning and a um, sudden injury, we don't have to do anything. Um, you leave it for about six weeks. The swelling, because an acute injury, that means an injury that just happened. One of the things that, uh, that occurs with it is it swells up. But as you give it time with some manipulation uh, management, the swelling then gradually reduces. And if it was pressing on the nerve roots because it was swollen, it then gradually um, stops pressing on that nerve root. So a patient that's having what we call sciatica, you know, as I described earlier on, because it's pressing, the herniated disc is pressing on the nerve root, we tend to say, okay, give it time, four to six weeks, because we do know that the disc will become shrunken by that time and it will stop pressing on the nerve root. If by after six weeks, it's still pressing on the nerve and causing pain, then we do send them to physiotherapy, uh, you know, to get into some uh, manual treatment, manipulation, massage, you know, uh, all kind of treatment, as well as exercises um, as a first line management, you know. So that's me talking about those things. Um, and I think I've talked about this slide before. Uh, in passing, and um, uh, so we go, we, yeah, okay, let's go, yeah, so this is kind of, I might just spend some time on this, um, um, just to mention some of them through the ages, and then I will, I will kind of sit down on the um, middle age uh, to old age, so in schoolboy, you know, as I said, back, uh, back pain is prevalent um, throughout the ages. Everybody has it. But some ages, when they are presenting with back pain, we take them more seriously because the causes of their back pain uh, sometimes has to be operated upon while some of them will be a sign of some other issues going on, you know, but back pain. So as schoolboys, uh, because uh, posture is quite bad, they carry their heavy bag on them and they are, you know, so most of them, 
the source of their back pain will be muscular in nature. Um, just because uh, they slouch, they carry uh, their bag and things like that. Um, however, the aspect that is called spondylolysis, um, what, what that just means is that, uh, let me see. Uh, oh, I was hoping to, okay. Uh, what that just means is that the, bones, the top and the bottom bone, there is a, an area that um, they join together, part of the where the top bone uh, link with the backbone, uh, the lower bone. Now, the, uh, for some reason, part of the bones where these joints happen will be missing. It might be due to a fracture or uh, just due to abnormalities in growth what then happens is the back becomes unstable. When we have issues like that in the, in, the, uh, in the young ones, it becomes like, okay, this cannot really be fixed by any activities or anything apart from surgical stabilization. And spondylolysis do in a lot of people leads to what is called spondylolisthesis. Spondylolisthesis just means the bone shifted on top of one another. So the uh, top bone now shifts forward for on top of the lower bone. If it's less than 25%, you know, the shift, uh, you might say, okay, you don't need uh, surgical manipulation or treatment. But if it's uh, more than 25%, then a surgical intervention of some sort will be needed. If not, it just leads to progressive um, and increasing back pain that will gradually worsen. And then um, you can imagine a schoolboy that still has about 80 years of his life to live um, already carrying a back pain or uh, some defect in the back. Um, so that's just uh, for the schoolboy. As a teenager, uh, most of their pain also is, is mechanical or muscular in origin. Mechanical because, of course, they are more likely to sit in front of TV and slouch or have bad posture. Uh, and gradually, uh, the mechanics of the back becomes um, not um, um, as smooth and as effective. Uh, gradually leading to back pain. And of course, they can have disc injury because of trauma uh, with activities. They are more likely to participate in sports and some sports involve, um, you know, uh, severe flexion and uh, rapid flexion of the back. And that um, all those sports do lead to um, uh, back injury, disc injury, back pain and of other trauma, maybe road traffic accident or sporting accident or um, um, other injuries. Uh, the soldiers, the commonest cause of their own back pain uh, is trauma, um, you know, um, uh, because of their trade. When I say soldiers, it does mean um, um, that age, you know, between 20 and 30 to 40s. Um, they are more likely to be employed in hard labors, work that involves, you know, heavy lifting and all those uh, will lead to injury uh, to the back, a disc injury, um, spondylosis, spondylosis, which is basically where and tear, you see, I was going to say it again, wear and repair um, of, the, of, the, of the spine and the facial joint injury um, is quite common in them. And then we come to those three a group that we're going to be talking about today. Um, uh, let me see what's on my next, next slide. Okay. So in those group, um, the commonest cause, <coughs> excuse me, wow. um, just been in the, in, the, in the garden or uh, in the fields. Um, so the commonest cause of pain um, in the, let me just go into in this um, three um, groups of people um, is um, what, uh, okay, come on, Aji. Uh, excuse me, let me just go back to that previous slide. 
uh, and uh, do this. Yeah. So those three groups of, um, shall I say, um, ages, the commonest cause of their back pain um, are what are listed here. Uh, you know, spondylosis or back arthritis, disc injury, um, other diseases also are prominent. So I'm gonna talk about those other diseases just in brief because um, majority of people, we know that, okay, the process of aging is what leads to their back pain. And that aging will lead to spondylosis, which is different from spondylolysis, which uh, in, in the children. Um, so spondylosis, um, our arthritis of the, of the back, uh, disc injury, because as they age, the disc also become desiccated, you know, losing water and then easily uh, can be injured by uh, just a simple, simple activities. Um, but in them, we have to also be mindful of other diseases. Um, and these diseases, we have what we call ankylosis spondylitis, whereby when you actually ask them, they go like, oh, you know, they wake up in the morning, it's like, oh, they have to stretch their back for about five, 10 minutes before they could get up from the bed. And then when they get up from the bed, they have to stretch this way, that way, that way for a while. And it takes them about 20, 30 minutes before they are actually able to get going. Um, it's not just aging uh, when you have a patient that's uh, presenting with such a problem. Um, you start thinking, okay, is this ankylosis spondylitis? Is it the back becoming fused? And the, you know, because that's what we call ankylosis spondylitis, whereby process of aging has led to the formation of you know, bones and all those things. And the process of inflammation also has led to formation of bone that now join all the vertebral column together to now become a stiff, a rigid thing instead of an easily movable, flexible um, structure. Um, so that's what we call ankylosis spondylitis. Um, then what we call myeloma, multiple myeloma. I said, earlier on, if the first time a patient comes to present with back pain is when they are in their 50s, then alarm bells should be ringing that um, something is not quite right. And uh, multiple myeloma is one of those things that uh, tends to uh, you know, be on the top of our mind. Um, it's a disease whereby the bone, um, you know, the bone marrow, we call it a, a source of blood production. But now inside there, there is um, cancer basically. Um, and then we'll have to do a various types of tests and everything. So I might not go into town about multiple myeloma, uh, but if any anybody wants uh, to ask any question about that or me to talk more about that, then you can ask the question, we deal with it. Cancer metastasis is also a common um, thing at this age group uh, because uh, that's when you start getting all those cancers uh, popping up. And uh, for women, breast cancer, and then we have thyroid cancer for men, prostate cancer. You know, they are the commonest uh, source of, of course, bowel cancer of uh, metastasis to the bones of the back. So that if a patient is uh, should I say presenting with first episode of back pain in their fifties, then you start, you know, you don't just think, oh, it's a wear and tear changes or degenerative changes of chronic, um, you know, old age, but you start looking for um, some other causes. And then you, you have to start asking questions. I put the red flag there because those are red flags questions so you have to then start asking questions about, okay, um, do you have this pain waking you up at night? Um, do you sweat a lot at night? Any issues with weight loss? You know, um, so the questions that, or uh, the answers to such questions, uh, we raise an alarm uh, to say, okay, 
um, we might have something else going on here rather than um, just a simple um, chronic uh, back pain that's been going on from when they were in their 30s, um, and, you know, basically because of uh, um, where, uh, where of the body. Um, then uh, in the old age, over 60s, and, uh, you know, uh, what they call the pantaloon, um, we have the, uh, you know, arthritis, osteoporotic uh, collapse of the vertebra, um, just because the, uh, what I said about earlier on about crumbling, crumbling spine, um, you have the spondylosis there again. And um, at that stage, we then have spondylolisthesis coming in again, because the back is now crumbling and um, any part of the vertebrae could now crumble. Okay, I use the word complain advisably. Um, uh, usually, if it's a patient sitting in front of me, I will try not to say combo because I don't want the patient to leave the surgery and say, oh, the doctor said I'm complain. Although you see people getting shot when they go to that stage is because, yes, the bones are being compressed, they are complain. The disc that uh, had separated and given the height, the disc is now gone basically in some places and the disc is also worn out in some places and the disc is, has lost its uh, buoyancy such that then they are being compressed and the disc space is reduced so they are the height of the people get reduced and uh, some people start hunching over um and of course the uh, cancer um, you know is now uh, prevalent in that age group also uh, with various cancer um and then um, when we then get to the second childhood, we also have osteoporotic collapse, instability, and cancer as causes of back pain. So that's like a kind of a whistle tour, we we'll stop uh, of various or some causes of back pain, and um, which I've not really been able to should I say, I might not have uh, dealt with fully, uh, but please ask the question so that I can answer uh, the questions, uh, you know, because I'm uh, talking about back pain, we can be here till tomorrow morning. So um, the next, this slide talks about management of chronic low back pain. And as we said earlier on, chronic because it's been going on for more than 12 weeks. Uh, you no know, patients more likely when you say, eyes ah, your back, they say it's chronic. They just mean it's a very bad pain. But a chronic is not a chronic pain is not the same thing to a doctor. A chronic issue or chronic pain is something that's been going on for more than 12 weeks. Um, and uh, in most middle-aged people, their back pain will have been going on for years. Um, so they will have done all various things, or they might not have done too much. They, you know, and then we, when you see them, or when we see them, we have to individualize their management, and that's what I've been talking about. What's called, what causes back pain in one person is different from what is causing back pain in the other person. You know, until you ask the question and ask them, they, you might not know what is actually the source of their back pain. Uh, and then when you see them, um, we, we call something STAT tool. STAT tool is a clever tool designed by University of Kiel. Uh, which is a lovely university. Uh, it's lovely because my daughter is there now, you know. So, um, you know, but it's uh, they they did a good work on uh, on back pain and the tools they designed. It helped a lot of people to actually simplify the management of back pain. And that was, you know, as I said earlier on, when I was training as a surgeon, I ran away after two, three years of spinal surgery, I ran away and said, you know, I'm not doing spinal and neurosurgery anymore. I'm going to go and do hip surgery, hip and knee, you know. Uh, but with uh, kill starts too. When you see the patient, you just need to ask them a series of questions. And when those questions are answered, the answers they give to the question guide you or guides on how 
their back pain is going to be managed. Some questions we, when you answer, ask them, especially as GPs, when you ask the questions, you know, we have nine questions there, you know, the questions one to three, they are simple bulk question in the last two weeks. How is your pain? What have you done? What has caused your pain? Or how has the pain affected your life and everything? And then the question five to nine, the, they are um, questions that actually look at what we call yellow flags or the psychological impact of the back pain. Because what we have found out and what has been found out also by loads of researchers is that back pain is not just a mechanical thing that a surgeon should just go and fix. But when people have long-standing what we call chronic back pain, what then happens is that it becomes things that affect their whole life. You know, so a kind of biopsychosocial model of looking at this uh, disease that affects health, affect, you know, cause a lot of disability and affect all industries and all ages. So the biopsychosocial model of looking at it, the biology saying, okay, yes, you are getting old, so that's why you are getting uh, back pain. Things are not working as they should. You know, it's like a ten-year-old car; it will start rattling here and there. It will pass his MOT, it will drive on the road, but it will have some rattling. So that's the basic back pain. But if your light, your car start turning on some lights, you know then you start worrying that maybe something else is going on. And that's what the start tool does. When we get a uh, question five to nine, if a patient should score three, you know, uh, over there, we now know that the patient cannot just be managed by the GP. So some of the questions we guide you us to say, mm -hmm. oh, you need to get the physiotherapist involved. And some of the question, we then, uh, the answer we tell us, we need to go into what's called cognitive functional therapy or behavioral therapy. I will go into that. So when you see the patient, part of the questions you ask and everything, and then what you would do is, is uh, you go and uh, use the start tool, you know. So now we go into uh those treatments um uh, that i've mentioned uh or that are on the screen medications okay let me just see where i am medications we uh, we say the medications i give you you know it's not basically uh to get rid of the pain because the basic foundation of the pain might not be what is amenable to medications, but the medications help with the back pain such that you will then be able to do other activities which allow the pain to get better and allow you to live, you know, in a world in a way that you are less disabled by this back pain because the most uh, you know, uh, intriguing and dis uh, disappointing aspect of back pain is it affects uh, lifestyle activities. And uh, as we said earlier on, it's um, the commonest cause of disability worldwide. So you use medications like anti-inflammatory, uh, we call it NSAIDs, non-steroid anti-inflammatory drugs. Um, ibuprofen, everybody can buy over the counter, uh, you know, um, and sometimes um, in some places, naproxen, um, uh, celebrex, uh, celecoxibs, or, or, you know, uh, a form of etolococcib and all those anti-inflammatory medications. Um, they could be bought over the counters and they are quite good for most of back pain, especially back pain of inflammatory causes. And that's one of the things that we, uh, we tend to uh, use also to guide us. If a patient is like, okay, you've used um, all medications or maybe you've used uh, weak opioids 
and uh, the weak opioids have not helped and they use the anti-inflammatory and wola, their pain is better. You start thinking, mm, okay, have I been looking at the wrong thing? Let's look again and call the patient in and start asking uh, another question uh, from this patient. Um, weak opioids, um, as I said, then we have uh, the latest, uh, not latest kind of medication, but what uh, another, uh, should I say, as now in the two, uh, in the management uh, is what we call the neuropathics. These are um, unusual analgesics, basically, which previously they were uh, designed for other things. So I tell my patients, Amitriptyline, which is the commonest one we use, uh, was initially designed for depression. But now we really use it for management of depression. It's mainly used for management of back pain, headaches, or pain of various types of things, pain of nerve endings and all those things. And it's quite an effective medication. Um, you take it at night. Um, when you give it to your patients, I mean, I've given it to my patients and I say, listen, when you get this medication, it's going to say uh, it's for management of depression, but I'm not giving it to you for management of depression. It's because it's been proven to work for this type of back pain you have. And of course, the patient goes home, they don't use the medication, they come back uh, three weeks later, they said, no, um, <laughs> I didn't use it because he said it's for depression, you know, but um, it's quite an effective medication. It's amitriptyline, 10 milligrams at night, but uh, you start at 10, but you can go up to 75 milligrams. And some people are now going up to 150 milligrams under the management of a pain team, chronic pain team. The other medications in these neuropathics, uh, we have the gabapentinoids, what we call the gabapentinoids, which consists of gabapentin and pregabalin. Um, they were initially, uh, you know, manufactured for management of seizures, epilepsy, but there are now better medications for management of epilepsy and seizures, so that the uh, the only use uh, don't let me say only use the commonest use now uh, for uh, pregabalin and gabapentin is for management of a uh, neuropathic type of pains um and in back pain they are working wonders in a lot of patients um then you have the last one duloxetine which was also an antidepressant but is now um you know using managing this pain and then we have uh, the other treatment for specific uh, causes of back pain um i mean some people might end up going on the morphine some people might end up going on steroids if their back pain is maybe from cancer or from metastasis or from trauma, um, you know, so they might need things like that. Um, okay. Uh, now, the, should I say by and large, nowadays, the main management of back pain is cognitive functional therapy, exercise and improvement on physical activity. Researches, loads have shown that, okay, this, uh, which is like oh, what's called integrated and flexible behavioral, uh, you know, my manipulation and change approach um, is being proven that it reduces the pain and disability in people. Um, you know, when I was talking about SMART 2, I said um, those questions five to nine, they help us to know how we're going to be of great help to this patient. Because when you talk to some of those patients and they come with what we call yellow flags, we you know a lot of psychological loads and baggages about their back pain. Oh, this back pain is not going to get better. I've had this back pain since I was in my 30, you know, and it's what stopped me from working. My husband is the one cooking now because I cannot even stand because of this back pain. Um, I've stopped working because of this back pain and all kind of things. Uh, now, I, you know, I can't go out, I can't socialize because of this back pain. Then you know that it's not 
one that you will just be saying, okay, go to physiotherapy or have physical therapist help with exercise. It's the one that you need to involve some well-trained, psychologically trained physiotherapists. You know, they are the one we tend to get to deliver this. Um, so they, the patient goes to chronic back pain clinic and the, the first thing they get done is we send them to go and have this cognitive functional behavioral therapy, basically. And that it consists of three things. You sit down with the patient to try and make sense of their pain. You know, you find out their history, the history of their pain. Oh, this pain started when I was 25. I just came out of my house and the door slammed behind me and I jumped. And since then I've had this pain, okay. And then they now tell you all kind of, you know, a tale of woes, how this pain is the one that has kept them on the uh, dole for since they were 25 years old, you know, and now they are now in their 52, 52 years, 53, 55. Oh, they might say, ah, okay. I had a car hit my uh, the back of my car and I had a whiplash. And then I had the back pain two weeks later, and that's where I started. Oh, all doctors have done the MRI, all kind of scans. They can't find anything. You know, okay, this one is not going to just be a simple one. So you send, you know, you make sense of their pain, hear their history. And when you've heard their history, then some of them actually, they are afraid. I put exposure with control in black. They are afraid to do any exercise or any activities because they have that belief that if I do anything that causes me pain, it makes my back pain worse. It means I'm doing damage to myself. So they don't want to do exercise. He say, oh, if I bend down to pick loads, it makes my back pain worse. So that means I'm doing something nasty. I'm doing more damage to my back, you know? And when you do that, uh, what we call exposure with control. One thing you do there is you actually get them to bend and pick something up, but guided, you know, activities. Those activities that they expected pain with, when you then gradually guide them through it and they don't get pain, you know, what we call expectation and experience gap. You know, so it's it's that gap that gives them the confidence to say, oh, maybe my back pain is actually not going to kill me. Uh, maybe I can find something to do with my life. And then quite a lot of people are returning to work in their 50s, in their 60s, and they're finding something to do. You know, if you talk to a patient and he says, oh, since my back pain, I've stopped working. And you say, oh, have you spoken to your employer? Maybe there is something else you can do at work and say, ah, that work, uh, this and that. You just know that, okay, this is one of those that will need uh, con cognitive functional behavioral therapy as, ma as part of their management, it, okay? And then lifestyle changes. Um, it, this is basic what we could do. And one of the reasons, uh, hopefully one of the benefits of this talk is to help people with lifestyle changes because we know obesity, smoking, and all those other things do cause back pain. And um, sedentary life, lack of activities, um, you know, lack of physical activities, they are all uh, you know, causes that allows people to develop uh, back pain as they old. Um, I'll come to that in a minute. So if you are able to institute some sort of lifestyle changes in the person, you know, that we also help in the management of their back pain. So nowadays, we're looking at this. A lot of patients, if you don't spend time to explain to them what it is about, they will just think, oh, the man thinks I, I am you know, loopy or I am mad up there. That's why he's sending me to a psychologist. I have pain in my back and he's sending me to the psychiatrist. He's sending me to the mental health team. They want me to go and sit down in the class, you know, because uh, the research has shown that doing this as a group class 
helps a lot. You know, it's just like uh, all those smoking, oh, hi, I am so, 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 I want to give up smoking, you know. So this kind of thing also do help a lot of people. So now, and this is the second, uh, should I say, uh, or the most uh, important aspect of the talk today, basically about physical activity and exercise as a form of treatment. And it's also as a form of prevention, you know, to stop people getting back pain. Um, there are quite a lot of, should I say, discussion, disagreement, and a lot of research is going on to try and find out what is the best form of physical activities? So someone might tell you, okay, mine is better than yours. Mine is the best, or this is the one physical activity that you need to do uh, to cure all your back pain. They will be lying because unless somebody actually tells you or speak with you or shows you a group of exercises, you know, to do, uh, there is no one exercise that we, uh, um, should I say, treat your back pain or will prevent back pain. It has to be a combination of exercises, you know, because uh, various things uh, cause the back pain, uh, whereby it could be muscular, it could be disc, it could be the bone, it could be the nerve, uh, you know, um, in origin. So where uh, exercises that has to do with all those things. Previously, we used to talk about the big, deep muscles, a group called the multifidus, um, which is a group of muscles that go from the top of the head to the, uh, to the bottom, um, you know, uh, and they are attached on to the uh, vertebrae. Um, they are quite, um, should I say important in maintaining core stability and everything. And that was why previously all exercises uh, was, oh, maintain core stability, maintain core stability, um, maintain back pain stability and uh, uh, back pain focus exercise or back focus exercise to uh, to strengthen the multifidus or group of multifidus, or, or, you know, and also what a big um, internal, um, what's it called, abdominals, uh, but it's the transversus abdominals muscle. It's the innermost uh, muscle muscle of the uh, group of muscles on the abdomen. So the two of them, the transversus abdominosus muscle and the multifidus, they, they work well and their importance in maintaining core stability and everything cannot be discounted. But back pain exercises is not only to be focused on them you do a range of exercises. Um, I think talks we talk about something later on, you know, but we say individualized strengthening program to maximize both static core muscle endurance and dynamic core stability, you know, is what we recommend for managing back pain. Um, it's a big word. It will be uh, teased out, uh, you know, with some uh, advice. So, and I said, not back focus, a combination of aerobic activity, movement instructions, muscle strengthening, postural control, and stretching, uh, you know, to maintain flexibility and, and, and this core stability. Um, because the cause of back pain, we said, is that from, you know, uh, when we were young, and uh, with bad postures, and when it starts, it then continues, and that gradually leads to things not being in a proper alignment. And um, uh, nowadays, there is always a talk of strengthening or resistance strengthening, and uh, various people, different people, if you've not been doing anything before, we say, okay, start with just rubber bands, um, and if you are, been doing something before you might have to use things uh, you can use dumbbells um, and if you are very good you use ankle weights um let me see as a doctor you cannot talk to me or anybody nowadays a doctor without being told about you know this 
physical activities, what uh, the whole world is recommending, which started from America basically, but then everybody now found out that it actually works with every uh, with, for all population and everything. And on the top there, the uh, top left, what is called uh, being sedentary. And that is why, um, you know, going forward in the low income and the middle income uh, countries, things are, you know, you know, the doom and gloom are getting bad is because their lifestyle initially, which used to be up and go, eat up, go, go farm, go hunt for your food and everything. A lot of people have become sedentary. And over here also, most work um, are now office-based. We go, we go, we sit down nine to five. You come home, you sit in front of television, you know, you just sit on the sofa. It's now what we call the second diabetes. It's causing so much. Um, should I say health issues and health challenges to all over general part of the body, you know, so that you have to keep moving and minimize sedentary activities, minimize the time you sit on the on the couch or you know, and uh, when you even if at work you have to work nine to five in front of your screen and everything. Now and then you get up, just stretch your back gently. You know, I mean, we've not spent a uh, uh, one hour, so I won't ask us to get up. In all our, um, should I say, uh, conferences and everything now, it's now incorporated. If you sit down for more than 45 minutes to one hour, everybody get up and we do exercises, you know, even if it's just stretch your hand, you know, bend forward, bend backward, uh, lift your leg up, you know, just, to interrupt that uh, sedentary nature, you know, even if it's just for five minutes or three minutes, um, it's, it goes a long way to, to get you uh, fitter and to help to maintain um, um, the stability, you know, which will accrue as you go, as you go along. Um, and the other form of physical activities, we say, okay, you should build strength, uh, you know, uh, do activities that build, that build strength uh, twice a week. And um, those uh, form of activities, if you can go to the gym, go to the gym. If you cannot go to gym, you say carry bags, you know, it just means carry anything that is weighty, um, not mm, uh, in a different way, but just be active and uh, so that you get the muscles I am working, uh, yoga uh, uh, is a form of uh, exercise. And um, we say for a healthy heart and mind, be active, get involved in any sport you can. If not, don't use the lift, use the stairs, it gets you up and down, you know, and the, uh, more, the activities you can do, um, if you can swim or if it's just getting up and walking. Walking, Walking, walking is one activities that some people don't know the uh, importance of it. But now uh, some companies have uh, caught up on it, and so they made it cheap. They said, okay, they give you a watch or they put an app on your phone, ten thousand steps a day. It every little helps. If you have not been doing anything before, even if it's just that ten thousand steps a day you can do, do it. It will help you to make you fitter and it also help to protect and prevent and might just help with your back pain. But if you have been an active person before, then picking up swimming and also uh, not just swimming, aqua aerobics, if you can get part of a lesson that does aqua aerobics, aqua aerobics is much more effective than just swimming. But if swimming is all you can do, then do it. Cycling, um, you know, is also uh, one of those uh, exercises that is recommended. And of course, dancing, Tai Chi and bowls. Basically, 150 minutes of moderate intensity activity or 75 minutes of vigorous intensity activity. So that just breaks down to 30 minutes, you know, every day or over five days of the week. Or you can just break it down to a slot of 10 or 15 minutes each day. 
your activity should be concerted, you should focus on it. And that's what we call exercise. You plan that, okay, for the next 10 minutes, this is what I'm doing. That is exercise, not just something you, uh, that just happened to happen, you know, but you focus, you plan it and say, okay, next 10 minutes, I'm going to walk around the block today in the morning. Next 10 minutes, I'm going to jump up or down, you know. So those are the kind of um, activities that actually build up strength, you know, physically in you generally and also help in managing your back pain. Um, okay. So as I was talking about the exercises before, um, I uh, just have a few slides more, a few slides of some of these exercises that you can actually do, uh, you know, that now focused on managing, you know, your back pain, not just keeping you fit, uh, like what I've just gone through, but this one, because um, the management of your back pain should involve flexibility, aerobics, stretch, and strength, um, you know, and this is one of those uh, one you do for flexibility, uh, whereby a lot of, a lot of us uh, will have done this before, you lie, you lie down on your back with hands that way, and then your knees bent um, almost at, uh, you know, almost reaching towards the bottom, if you cannot get it to your bottom, wherever you can get it to, just bend it, and then rotate the leg, um, uh, you know, and let your leg lie this way while you maintain your back uh, on the floor uh, in a supine position with your hands clasped behind your head. Um, if you have not been uh, doing exercises before, it's always better to get this taught to you or shown to you by a physical therapist or someone like Tokumbo whose work is in that uh, aspect. Um, so, they this help with uh, you know flexibility exercise another flexibility exercise which is quite easy which you can do uh, if you have been sitting down for 45 minutes or more you just stand up you know uh, one one hand on the wall the other leg flexed behind you um if you cannot um, hold it up to the bum, that's fine. Whatever you can do, gradually you get there, uh, you know, to do it and just do it. We always say this exercises is not just you hold it, you drop it. I always tell my patient, count one to ten. If you are a seasoned, uh, you know, should I say exerciser or someone who is sporty, you stay there for fifteen to twenty seconds you know, uh, each each movement. But if you just want to start by counting one to eight, uh, when you hold that, count one to eight, put it down, hold the other one, count one to eight, and then the other le uh, one leg stretch, you stretch it in front of you, also count one to eight. They help, you know, in managing back pain because they make the whole body uh, to function uh, in a proper way. And this knee to chest, um, you know, is also one of those uh, common exercises that is recommended and is quite effective in managing back pain. Uh, that's for flexibility. And this is for strength, whereby you, while you are lying uh, supine, that means you are lying on your back with knee flex, you suck your belly in. Uh, from the uh, from the uh, belly button or because so you kind of suck the belly in as if you pushing yourself into the into the floor um, you know and it does help uh, we strengthen the belly strengthen the back um, you know uh, let's see do I have one more okay a very a various um, I remember this um, you know uh, there was one time we had uh, the union in Lagos. Uh, when I was, you know, when I said the union is because I, I can see some of my classmates were uh, uh, here on forum and uh, we had to, uh, early in the morning, you know, this person got us out to come and be doing exercise. And this was one of those ones, you know, and the various, uh, should I say, types of it, uh, you know, and there are various names given to them, but all you just need to do is go on all fours then lift one hand, um, you know, while you are maintaining um, the angle and the stability of your back, um, and then lift the other hand also, 
some people they are able to do cross uh, cross leg uh, cross hand so mm -hmm. they, let's say you lift your right hand and then you lift your leg left leg behind um it's it's all progression you know but if this is all you can do go ahead and do it 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 all help but um most exercises is always advised uh either you get a video of it or get um uh, someone to put you through and then finally you can start doing it because one thing we found when the management of back pain giving the patients what they can do at home um you know works well and it helps in managing this uh, uh disab disabling condition which is costing a lot of money to government costing family breakdown you can you can't believe it um you know um okay uh, uh non-surgical treatment uh, manual therapy manipulation i think i'm mindful of the time so i'm just going to um quickly um so the surgery um I might not go into town on that so on the surgical aspect, but if anybody, if a question comes, then I will attack, I, I, I will attack uh, that question or I will answer that question. But various surgical manipulation, um, if there is prolapse disc that is causing compression, um, or, or or there is a um, should I say arthritic area uh, causing uh, spinal stenosis or uh, causing um, uh, you have a osteophyte formation, uh, that's extra bone formation, causing impingement, narrowing the spinal canal. Uh, spinal stenosis is one of the commonest cause of back pain. Um, you know, when someone tells you, if I stand up for too long, my back starts aching. You start thinking, oh, in my house back, uh, spinal stenosis. And if you tell them, well, if you bend forward, what happened? Oh, it gets better. Then the person most likely has spinal stenosis. And if you see all those old women, when they go shopping, they are more likely to lean on their uh, uh, cart trolley, uh, shopping trolley and everything is because they've got spinal stenosis and it gets better when you lean forward. And, uh, you know, and if you stand straight, it gets worse. So some of them, we have to do laminectomy where a uh, part of the bone is chipped off to create more space for things to move around. Um, that's laminectomy, you, uh, what is called lamina, uh, part of the vertebrae um, is taken off. But uh, if anybody wants more question, I will, I will address that. Discectomy, you go and remove the disc that is prolapsed. Um, you know, which is causing uh, pressure on the thing. Um, for about 20 years ago, all of a sudden, we came up with disc replacement. Um, and now a lot of people, uh, you know, before, um, you know, when I was doing my spinal surgery training, uh, the first two was all what we could, uh, you know, what we could offer. A few people were doing uh, disc replacement, but it wasn't really, it was still, it was kind of crude then, whereby, okay, a few things were just being injected to create uh, increase in disc space, um, you know, when there has been collapse. But now it's a refined uh, procedure with various things being done uh, to replace the disc and uh, all kind of things. And it's giving a lot of people that, uh, uh I've, I've thought okay that's it for me it's giving them a new lease of life uh you know by having their disc replaced um obviously and i will just say this spinal fusion is one of those in instability surgery does not usually relieve back pain and most of the time you won't have surgery done because of your back pain but you will have surgery done because there is something that is pressing on the nerve or pressing on the cord, and so it's causing further issues down the leg. So the surgery will help with the pain of compression of the nerves, which is worse than your back pain. Where people that have it, they you know, they know, you know. So surgery will remove all those uh, issues, but the back pain itself you know, we not, you know, it's usually not helped by the surgery. Um, so the things that usually he uh, help the back pain is the manner treatment, um, exercise, physical activity, and cognitive functional therapy, 
uh, uh, management. Um, let me see, that should be my last slide. Yes, that's my last slide. So the um, talks, um, it's over to you. Uh, anybody uh, or any questions? We actually have, we actually have questions, really. Um, okay. Okay, if you can stop sharing. Okay. Okay. Thank you so much, um, Dr. Ajigene. Um, uh, it's been really- Wow, bad. sorry. I didn't know I've taken so much time. <laughs> <laughs> and I was thinking I didn't. Uh, <laughs> okay, we have quite a number of questions really. And uh, thank you so much for our participant. I've seen some questions in the chat box, which, okay. are going to, which I think you have access to. But we have some questions from our Facebook viewers, and I'd like to read uh, the ones from the Facebook first. The okay. first question here says, the last three back pain courses under middle age, can one experience them earlier in the schoolboy or teenage stages? Yes, is the answer. Okay, because um, the uh, back pain, and the let me just am I am I just go to um uh, I go to this particular slide just to answer that question. Uh, I just uh, just let's see this. You know I don't know if you can see uh, you might not be able to see that slide you know because I'm not I'm. Uh, I'm not sharing it at the moment, okay. You know, but the answer is yes. You know, because most of the causes of back pain that we get in the middle age, they actually start from, you know, when we were teenage uh, or when we were in that um, uh, soldier age, uh, you know, what you call soldier age. So that means when we are teenagers or when we're in the 20s and 30s. And that's why I said, if the first time you experience a back pain is in your middle age, your 40, uh, late 40s and 50s, the doctors get worried, you know, because we know that back pain, as it were, uh, usually start from, you know, the teenage years and the, um, the 20s with various causes. A lifestyle, you know, people being overweight, people not maintaining good physical activities, you know, or having an injury and then they've not really been uh, uh, been managed or managed themselves properly. Um, so, yes, all those causes that you might see in the middle age, they actually usually start uh, from the lower, you know, from okay. teenage and twenties. All right, thank you. Then another one says, which when one has consistent back pain mm -hmm. before age 50, with proper management in place, does it ever go away? Um, depending on the cause, okay. But the, the thing about it is when people have uh, the one that is because of where changes on the body, we now do all those exercises and the training and the teaching education about it, so that instead of back pain causing and uh, becoming a disabling condition, it's actually a condition that you can manage and you can live with. You know, I talked about a ten-year-old car. We have some rattling, but it can still take you here and there and work properly. And that's one of those things that we do with back pain uh, to make sure that it does not become a disabling condition. So that yeah, a lot of people, the 90 year old man that is running, he has back pain, but it's just that he's not letting it affect his life and become a disabling condition. And that's what uh, the management of back pain is all about. Okay, then I have um, in the chat box, we have some questions in the chat box here. Um, okay. Yeah, um, there is one here that says, I have back ache from an exercise injury in 2019. Mm. which still pains me when I try to turn 
in my sleep please what can i do okay so and and this is where you start asking the patient okay so what sort of exercise actually injured the back um you know and uh, the best thing i would say is to sit down with a physical therapist so that the person sees you and you are able to say okay this is where my back pain is this is what uh, i did that injured it and then when you are examined um we will then be able to say okay this uh, one Yes, it was uh, done to exercise injury, maybe an exercise that was done wrongly, but these are the right exercises to do, which will help to restore, you know, uh, strength, flexibility, and stability to the back. Um, it might hurt when you turn. And that's why I was talking about the cognitive functional uh, therapy aspect. You find out what the history of the patient is, then you now expectation with control. You get put them through that process that causes pain, you know, but you teach them how to go about those processes. And you, they, what, you, what, they, what the research has shown is that it's actually found out that when they now get through those processes with control and guidance, it's not causing them that much of uh, pain or disability. And then they start finding it helpful and they're able to do uh, various sorts of exercises to make sure that their back pain is actually manageable and able to live with. Okay. Uh, we have another one there. I don't know. Can you read the chat box? Yes, I'm just uh, I'm just going to go and also have a look. You can ask me some and then I, will, okay. I can yes. see. I wasn't monitoring the chat box. I'm so sorry about that, guys and girls and ladies. Okay. okay. Can I just read one out? Is here is yeah, yeah, go ahead. you should touch on the influence of diet, calcium supplement, alternative okay. therapy, um, acupuncture, yoga, etc. Okay. And then how about exercises now to avoid lower back pain tomorrow? What type is best? Okay. Um, all right. let's, let's start from the back going forward. Exercises now to avoid back pain in the future. Um, if you see that physical activity chart that I showed, um, you have mixed range of exercises to be able to do, um, you know, to avoid um, uh, you know, should I say to maintain a healthy, physical, active life? So, what the government or governments of the world says is 150 minutes of moderate intensity activity and or 75 uh, minutes of vigorous intensity activities in a week. So, you now have range of activities. Some people and, uh, uh, you know, okay, one of the things that has to be included, which a lot of people now say is that your exercise has to include a strengthening exercise, an aerobic exercise, flexibility, you know, and core stability exercise, basically. So when you do strengthening exercise, uh, so that involves resistance, uh, various form of resistance exercises, Aerobic activities that involves, you know, various aerobic activities. Um, I, I, I'm just trying not to go back and start sharing my slide, but um, I think um, Tokes might be able to uh, show it. Later. You know, those group of activities, they uh, increase your physical activities, you reduce being sedentary, and all that will put your body in a tip top shape for the future. Not only will they help to prevent, you know, the development of back pain, they will also help to manage a back pain if the person has developed it. And where we talk about diet is also where we talk about obesity and lifestyle changes. Um, you know, um, diet, talking about diet is a big topic. I didn't even know I've talked for so long. I, you know, uh, before we started our talk talks, I'm just going to talk for 40 minutes. And, uh, you know, I didn't know, I, I, I didn't know I've talked for so long. So, you know, uh, and 
So, and if I go into diet now, that's going to be, but yes, maintaining a balanced and healthy diet, you know, help the whole body. Um, that could be another talk for another day. Um, reducing sedentary lifestyle. Please, that is, we all slip into it. Before you know it, you come back from work, you see that I do eat a lot. I sit down and eat, it's where I eat, I will sleep. And I will be watching TV. Before I know it, I've sat down, I've watched TV for two hours. You know, meanwhile, you know, so that kind of a thing. Reduce the sedentary nature of your life. Maintain uh, physical activities. And it will help to prevent back pain and also to manage back pain. Um, calcium, yes, calcium and vitamin D has become, you know, so popular nowadays. They... Uh, it manages almost everything now um, in medical uh, science and in medical life. Before you hear, you have a seminar or a talk, somebody will talk to you about calcium and vitamin D. And it's all because it gets incorporated into most of the uh, systems and uh, uh, metabolic processes. And it helps to maintain the quality of bones uh, because as you get old, osteoporotic happens, which is a, um, a, one of the ways to uh, combat it. Um, and uh, calcium and vitamin D, uh, yes. In UK, we say take one uh, vitamin D over the counter, 800 to 1,000 units uh, a, a day, um, because we don't get enough sun. Even in countries that get enough sun, because we all run away from the midday sun to two, to two o'clock which is the sun that actually produces vitamin D, um, you also should be taking, you know, uh, one tablet of vitamin D a day. I hope that answers that question. Okay, we, we just have two more. Um, uh, this one says reflex muscle spams or cause, spasm, yes. spasm rather, spasm or cause as a protective phenomenon over diseased area. Yeah. Any role for antispasmodics, spasmodics, yeah. Yeah, antispasmodics, we use antispasmodics for acute back pain. So if you, when I say acute, it means an injury, if an injury happens, that's when you get reflex muscle spasm to act as protective. And I tell my patient that, okay, reflex muscle spasm is your body trying to protect you and protect yourself from further damage, but you need to move your back you need to move. So because of that, I'm not going to allow this reflex muscle spasm to stay for too long. So I'll give you a short course, two, three days of uh, antispasmodics. A majority of people for lower back, I give them the acepam five milligrams twice a day, um, you know, for about five days. Because as I said with the analgesics, I'm not using it to take away your back, to cure your back pain. I'm using it to relieve the spasm and, uh, you know, so that you can move because I want you to move. I want you to get going to move and to exercise. So the azepam, I use it for a short period, maximum three to five days, you know, in managing acute lower back pain, which is a back pain due to injury. If a car hits your car from the back, your muscle going to spasm, you know, if it's neck, I do not use um, the acepam. Nowadays, we have what is called metrocarbamol. It's a different antispasmodic medication. The acepam doesn't work well on the neck um, uh, muscles. It works more for lower back muscles. So I use the acepam for lower back muscles for two to three days, uh, you know, and um, but for long standing pain. And you should not use the acepam for more than five days. A pa a patients become addicted to it because it relieves their spasm. They don't want, you know, and they say, oh, give me more, give me more. If the doctor gives you more, the muscle becomes so lax and you are not really able to do much. So, yes, uh, the space for it is only for three to five days in my own book. If you come back next week and you say you want more diazepam, I will give it to you. You're not going to get it from me. Uh, if you come back to me and say you need diazepam, that's when I'll send you to the uh, uh, physiotherapist and I'll... Okay. 
I think uh, we've, it's frozen there. Okay, while we're waiting for him to come back on, um, I'd just like to play us um, just a short video. We'll soon be rounding up. And thank you so much for your patience. Um, I'd just like you to play a short video. Then I'd like to share a link with us. Hello, do you experience back pain? Do you experience pain during prolonged sitting or standing? Or sometimes when you bend forward or you bend to the side? Or when you try to reach and take things? Do you sometimes experience pain when you lie down on the bed or getting out of bed? Or sometimes when you are walking, then this program is meant for, for you. Exercise is one of the recommendations for managing back pain. And I put together four videos that deals with different aspects. And you, there are exercises you can do, some standing, some sitting, some on the floor. They are both stretches and strength exercises. Exercises, exercises have been proven to support the spine, to relieve pain, to strengthen and repair muscles that support the back, and also to support to strengthen our leg and core muscles as everything is interwoven. So I recommend this program. You can do it every day or you can do it every other day. And I guarantee you it will improve your quality of life. Okay. Thank you so much. Uh, while we're waiting for Dr. Abayo, I'm going to share the link for the, uh, for the exercise video in the in the chat box um the link to have access to the um exercise video are there and really we can't say but dr ig has said a lot about the management and prevention of um back pain and we cannot rule out the need to include regular physical activity um in our program and um we all have different tastes and just as he has said, one of the things I've encountered in my work is that sometimes people think uh, back pain and exercises are not compatible. But actually, if you have issues with your back, doctors, as Dr. Ajia said, you will need to move more. Um, the four videos contain stretch exercises to improve your flexibility. There are also strength exercises. And it's also good for older adults. For those of us that have uh, grandmothers, grandfathers, people that have limited mobility, there are exercises that they can do. There are seated stretch exercises that are involved. There are standing ones. And there are also floor stretch exercises and floor strength exercises that you can do um, to protect your back. Uh, let me just check if Dr. Aji is back on. Okay, so um, I have a comment here that I would like to read, which you also bought, Teresa. Uh, uh, it says, stomach exercises will also help strengthen your core and take the pressure off your back. A weak stomach will contribute to back pain as the back will try to compensate for the weak stomach, which is meant to help your posture. Okay, if you need any form of personalized guidance on effective exercise programming, for you to do if you have not been exercising at all that is what i do i'm a qualified fitness instructor i've been doing this work for over 25 years i'm a gp referral instructor and we also deal with referrals from the doctor we do assessment we do exercise recommendation and programming for them so if you need assistance in being able to put proper exercise in place that will be applicable to you kindly get in touch with me. I will leave my number and my email address in the chat box. Okay, Dr. I, Dr. Abayo is here. Okay. I'm so sorry. <laughs> I'm right. so sorry Let's for some reason. Okay. Uh, the, the internet just decided to, you know, which is uh, which is quite interesting. Uh, we'll have to talk to Mr. BT. <laughs> okay. Uh, so sorry. So sorry about that. So, uh let's see any more questions no i think that's really and i've shared the video and the link 
okay. that I, I, I discussed with you. Okay. A question in the chat box, please. Okay. All right. Okay. okay. One moment. Um, the use of muscle relaxant, any need in back pain? If that's the question, it's just as uh, I said about, uh, you know, um, uh, reflex muscle spasm. Uh, you don't really, there is no space, you know, for muscle relaxants in back, uh, in back pain, unless in the, um, should I say, acute phase in the first uh, week of it. And the only purpose of that is just if um, there has been an injury, then as someone has put it, and which is what the body does, the muscles and all the structures, I tell the people, okay, that back is got muscles, it's got ligament, it's got the disc and everything. When one part is injured, every other goes into spasm as a protective mechanism um, by the body. Um, so at that initial stage, yes, uh, using uh, muscle relaxant is fine. Um, uh, but after the first week, I don't, I don't uh, give muscle relaxant anymore. Um, or uh, you won't get. Oh, oh. Like that's a palm for me. That's a palm. Um, so someone is a. So you won't get that from me, uh, you know, and uh, it's not really advisable anymore because the acute phase of the pain uh, where the muscle relaxant as a protective mechanism has passed. And also that is why for back pain, we also don't recommend rest as a treatment. We recommend initial rest for two to three days, just so that your pain can get better. But the sooner you start moving that back, the better. And then um, the movement will be a kind of graduated, um, you know, exercise uh, uh, processes. Um, I'm sorry, I missed uh, Tuk's uh, video, but uh, uh, I can see she's sharing, you know, some details and everything over there. Uh, and now, uh, you know, but yes, you need to move. We give the painkillers to help the pain and the relieving of the pain is so that you can get the movement going. Um, and that's what has been shown to help a lot in back pain, um, you know, combination of exercises um, you know, as, as earlier discussed. Okay, I think, um, I think we're done now. Oh, okay. <laughs> All right. He says by stomach, the previous writer meant abdominal exercises as such. You can't exercise your stomach. Exercise helps the core and supports the back. A very strong core is very, very important. Yes. Thank you so much for that contribution. Okay. I think any other contribution? I think, um, I think that is it now, Dr. Aj. All okay. right, thank you so so much. No, um, no, no, it's been a pleasure. I really appreciate you, and uh, thanks for all uh, the guys and girls. You know, it was quite nice seeing some of my colleagues. You know, um, uh, I hope I, uh, uh, you know, uh, people have been able to gain one or two things uh, yeah. from it. And um, as I said, and as W W H O said. This is the decade for us to age gracefully and age successfully. So we look and do everything that we can do. Um, you know, uh, we, uh, there's a supermarket in this country that's every little helps. You know, so we need to put everything in place to allow us, you know, to age successfully and age gracefully. And whatever you can do, whatever you know you have, that you can use to actually be involved in getting people to age gracefully and age successfully, it might be an opportunity for you to be able to make a bubble too while you are helping, you know, uh, the, uh, the world population and uh, reducing disability. 
Um, thank you all for for you know for spending your evening with me. I'm so sorry, um, uh, Tokes. I'm so sorry. No, uh, you know, <laughs> I thought I spoke for forty minutes, and I I told her I'm going to speak for forty minutes, and I was and I was still talking. Oh my! <laughs> but it's been nice to spend the evening with you guys. Thank you so much. Uh, and closing word for our participant online and also via Zoom. Uh, for especially for those that have not been exercising at all, I will advise uh, because when it comes to exercising, safety and effectiveness is very important. And you want to uh, ensure that exercise you do will not worsen whatever back pain that you have. So kindly get the assistant of a professional to put through to put you through the proper technique of doing the exercises and if you get access to the videos i took time to explain how to do the exercises effectively the ones you have mastered the exercises then you can do them on your own thank you so much for joining kindly share the link with other people that you know will benefit from it and hope to see everyone again on our next health program thank you so much Thank you all. Have a nice evening. Well done. Okay. Hey, thank you. All right. All right. Thank you. Well thank you. 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 Thank you.